Okay, so the article that I picked was um, Evaluating Indian Aesthetics by uh, Dr. Sam Trivedi. And like I said, it was a, a, a pretty introductory article, uh, but I do think that it raises some interesting questions for discussion and analysis. And it gives you a sense of what kind of ideas um, and analysis is available in this tradition uh, for further research. So this is a beautifully organized article, three sections, each section sort of focuses on about five points. So I'll kind of go through it to remind us of what we're talking about and also so that we can come back and refer to these, um, these uh, issues if, if, we, uh, if we want to do these slides, but I don't wanna to dwell too long on any, any point. Um, feel free to stop me if there's something that's just really confusing. Uh, but if not, we'll try and move through. And then, uh, like I said, I think there's gonna be plenty to discuss here. Um, as we go forward. So let me just see, hopefully it will let me know if anyone else needs to be let in. Okay, so there are, like I said, this is a pretty beautifully organized essay. There are two aims, really the second aim is the main focus, but there is this overarching aim in the essay, which is to argue that we can learn from art, the art and aesthetics of non-Western civilizations. Um, and I think that seems, pretty uncontroversial, but it does raise interesting questions about, in general, what we can take from the past. Because I think as philosophers, we're very fascinated with what people think thousands of years ago. But, uh, but that might be odd for some people, right? Because you might think, well, we've moved on, presumably, right? We no longer find those art forms interesting. We no longer believe those things that they believed about the world or about, you know, uh, life. Uh, so, you know, what can we gain from the past? So that there is this overarching aim of the essay, which is to give us a counterexample to the claim that there's nothing to be gained from the past. And the counterexample that this uh, author, Trivedi, focuses on is Rasa theory in classical Indian aesthetics. And he's gonna say it has relevance for us today. So the structure of the essay, like I said, is beautifully organized, three parts. First, we have some of the very basic ideas of Rasa theory. Then we have five criticisms that might make you think, wait a minute, there's limited usefulness to this theory. And then we have five lessons we can learn uh, where he thinks we really can engage with this and gain from their, their understanding um, of you know, this tradition that went on for thousands of years or was, was felt over the course of at least a thousand years. Okay, so uh, just to give you a, a general idea of rasa theory, um, rasa is a Sanskrit word with many meanings and every every article I read on rasa gave a different different collection of meanings, but there is a kind of uh, flav uh, well, flavor most appropriately to them all, right? So essence, taste, flavor, it's also the word for sap or juice of a plant or even just the nourishing, the nourishing juices in food, right? Um, and so the, the really, they really play on these multiple meanings of the term uh, in the analysis. And rasa theory um, as applied to art is an emotive theory of artistic meaning that claims the purpose of artistic works is the creation of a particular artistic flavor or dominant aesthetic emotion, which can be savored by the audience. Right. Um, so there's wonderful analogies in the literature of a work of art being like a cup of good chai, where you put in all of the different spices and you sort of heat it up and they all mix together and you get that one dominant flavor that you can savor. So in savoring it, there's this, there's this dominant kind of taste. There's this, there's this psychological experience of drinking the chai that is the aim of the whole purpose of making it. Um, and in that, there's, there's, a, there's a depth and a richness that you can save, especially, savor, especially if you have a cultivated palate. And the same thing with art. We're going to get this account that there's all these elements that go into the production of an artwork. They contribute to this dominant flavor or taste of the artwork that a competent observer can savor. And that's how best to understand uh, the aims of art. Okay, so the introduction that we get to the theory from... Uh, Dr. Trivedi is, uh, first of all, he gives us a, three brief caveats. One is that he's going to focus on a single text, uh, which is the foundational text in Rasa theory, 
by Baharada and it's Natya Sattva, which is translated as the treatise on drama. Uh, now this, this I've heard dated 300 BCE, or no, 300 CE to 500 BCE. <laughs> like there's a big range. He, he says that it's anywhere from the fifth century BCE to the eighth century CE when this, this text was written. Um, but it's incredibly, it has been incredibly influential. influential. He also says that given the introductory nature of his remarks, he's not going to engage in comparative aesthetics by, say, comp comparing rasa to the theory of Aristotle. Uh, he does mention Aristotle and Hume along the way, but that's not his primary aim. Um, he also says he's not going to talk much about subsequent rasa theory, which does tend to have a more religious and cosmological uh, twist as, as greater aspects of Indian philosophy was sort of brought into the analysis of art. Uh, there is developments of uh, sort of religious aspects and, and cosmological aspects that he doesn't want to get into given the introductory nature of the text. And then he also points out that the, you know, the, the, the foundational document that he's talking about was very specifically about dr dr drama, you know, um, and, you know, dr drama combines poetry and music and, and performance, dance, but uh, it was very much focused on that art form, very specifically. Nonetheless, Rasa has been expanded to cover more types of art, artistic expression in, as it developed through the centuries. But Trivedi doesn't think it was ever really applied to things like beauty and nature, right? Whereas uh, for some people, the aesthetic response begins with things like the response to sunsets and things like that. Okay, so what does he basically tell us? Um, Again, I think there's sort of five things in this first section. We get, first of all, a taxonomy of the emotions. So one of the things that Baharata does is meticulously catalog what he thinks are our psychological states and our emotions is a pretty good word to, to term for it. But as we'll see, some of the things are more like states of being than, than what we would call emotions maybe, right? So he identifies 41 ordinary emotions 33 of these are transient states, uh, which are things like despair, disquiet, and joy, but also states like fatigue, dreaming, and remembrance, which we might not naturally call emotions now, but you can see that they're kind of this, you know, psychological ways of being. And these are sort of transient. Um, and he contrasts these with more durable emotions. And he labels eight of those, love, laughter, compassion, anger, energy, fear, disgust and astonishment. And I've seen different ways of translating these eight. But the general idea here is that there are sort of more, sort of more enduring emotions. And nowadays, we might contrast between, say, feelings and emotions, where feelings are more transitory and emotions are more durable. Or we might contrast between emotions and moods. And sometimes there are things that we think of our emotions that are so durable that we almost don't even think of them as psychological states anymore, like happiness, right? Some people say happiness is kind of a life characterizing trait rather than a particular emotion anymore. Um, so I can I think this is a really interesting taxonomy to sort of identify the sort of more transient emotions and then the, the more uh, durable ones. And he gives us just eight. Uh, now these psychological states get presented in an artwork and they give us eight rasas, or eight flavors, eight tastes, which are aesthetic emotions now they correspond to the eight durable emotions, but it's important to remember that they're not just the eight durable emotions because there's something about them being presented in an artwork that's gonna change their nature. Um, but you can kind of see that art, this, this idea is still maybe in our way of understanding art, especially dramatic works, in that we tend to characterize them in terms of genres. And if you think of the way we categorize genres and then think about this list I'm about to read, maybe it makes sense that we're thinking about a sort of dominant mood or emotion with each of those, right? So the eight rasas are erotic love, comic laughter, grief, fury, heroic spirit, fear, revulsion, and wonder, right? Um, and I think just sort of thinking about that and hearing that list, you can see how, yeah, maybe there's some of this in the way we even like you know, pick out a movie, right? <laughs> do you want a comedy? Do you want a horror film? Do you want uh, a scary movie? 
Okay, uh, a couple other quick points on this. The four rasas are also themselves organized. Uh, there's the four that sort of he says are, are foundational or original, and then the ones that arise from that. So you've got the original ones are erotic love, fury, heroic spirit, spirit, and revulsion. And then the other four come from these. So if you have a mimicry of erotic love, you get comedy. If you have grief, um, can emerge from fury. Heroic spirit can give way, ways to wonder and revulsion can give rise, rise to fear. Um, which I think is an interesting point, but it also shows you how, um, you know, how these, this taxonomy is going forward, like, you know, more analysis, more trying to understand the relationships between these various states. Uh, and here's a, here's a claim, again, that, you know, just as you might in a dish not want too much going on, you do want a dominant flavor, right, something that, that people can recognize and enjoy. Uh, Baharata thought you should need a dominant rasa, right? And so if there's other rasas in a work, they're there to support the dominant one, right? So he might not have been happy with dramedies, for example, where drama and comedy are very equally mixed. Um, we also get the four aspects of psychological states, and this allows him to say things about how these rasas are to be developed on stage, because he notes that when you have an emotion or a psychological state, there's the thing that causes it. There's your immediate reaction to that thing that's causing this emotion. There's a more conscious uh, developed reaction. And then there's the sort of total effect in your sort of more enduring long-term self, right? So you could have, he gives the example, the author of erotic love, you know, you could stimulate erotic love by having a beautiful, you know, scenery with flowers or, you know, things that remind you of, uh, things that are beautiful or desirable that might make the characters perform, you know, coy glances, mouth sweet words, and these are the reactions to this, the, the triggers. Um, and then they will, uh, you know, maybe as a, re as a response have transient motions, maybe someone will get jealous, right? Or they'll, they'll just laze around feeling love thoughts and languor. And then eventually uh, it, it contributes to a dominant feeling of love. So if you have the characters present all this on stage, then the person watching or the work itself and there's an interesting debate about how much of this is happening in the work itself, how much of this is happening in the audience, and how much of this is, you know, something that the artist is putting in, right? So that's something in the literature that's interesting to follow. Uh, but eventually, if you get this, you can get the, do the dominant flavor of this aesthetic uh, sentiment of erotic love in your piece. Um, okay, so again, setting out the theory, it's a reminder that this is a motive theory, meaning that we're, we're, we're told that this is the sort of purpose of art. Um, and this is the, the, where the meaning of art is to be found. Uh, I, I heard a point that was kind of interesting that most of these dramatic performances, everyone in the audience would have known what was going to happen, because a lot of them were retelling of sort of traditional stories, um, or, you know, excerpts from various religious works. And so everyone knew what was going to happen. So if you know what's going to happen, you might say, what's the point of watching it? And so here's a clear state statement that the point of watching it is this sort of psychological experience that you're given of having these, these rasas, being able to savor these emotional tones that are set by the artistic work. Um, so this is a quote from the text. All literary meaning, Baharata tells us, involves some kind of emotion or sentiment, thus giving us an emotive theory of literary and more broadly artistic meaning Rasa, we are told, arises or emerges from a combination of the psychological states, amongst other things, just as a taste in food is the result of combining various condiments and ingredients. Another thing that's really important here is this idea of the cultured person. So you might say, like, you know, you don't really taste wine until you get a little bit of experience with wine. And here's, a, here's a, 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 an idea about art. You don't really appreciate art until you become a cultured person who's ready to appreciate art. And this is something that Hume kind of touched upon. He thought that you know, all responses to beauty were just purely subjective, but nonetheless, there were better responses than others because you can train your ability to respond. Uh, and so this notion of the cultured person or the rasika uh, becomes a key element in this, right? That you, know, you have to be in the right space to taste and savor the flavor. 
Um, and there's a nice description in the text of the sort of things that a culture person must do. I've sort of summed it up as you have to have a, a bit of knowledge, you have to have the right kind of knowledge about the artwork, kind of art you're working with, right? The traditions and the culture of the art you're working with. And then also you have to have abilities to have um, impartial and sensitive judgments, right? So you have to be able to be observant in a certain way, be sensitive to certain things. Now, why is this so important? And this is because the aesthetic has this feature of transcendence in Rasa theory. So when we taste and enjoy Rasa, we're, we're not enjoying the mental state of the characters on stage, right? We're not, we're not enjoying an everyday emotion. Um, what, we, what the aesthetic does is it allows us to sort of generalize away from the particularity of you know, individual people and their connection to see things in a more generalized form. So it becomes about love itself um, rather than these two people being in love. And in part, this is gonna help us solve the problem uh, that some people call the paradox of horror, for example. Why do people you know, go and watch things on movies where terrible things are happening you would run away from in real life? And so one of the resources here is to say, well, look, the, you know, the, the kind of horror that you experience in a horror film is not the kind of horror you film experience in, the, in, in real life. Aesthetic emotions are not real emotions. Okay, so the criticisms of Rasa theory, and again, I'll go through these pretty quickly because I don't want this just to be me talking. <laughs> um, he gives us five, um, and they're kind of things that might make us think about you know, how we do, uh, some of them are specific to Rasa, but some of them are sort of more general questions about how we react to um, you know, the, the traditions and the, and the thought process of those who have come before us. So one is that we might think that just focusing on these emotions or these flavors is too limiting, right? Maybe not all, all, all art is emotive. What about modern conceptual art? Sometimes it very, tries very hard not to trigger any kind of emotional response, right? So uh, why should we think that this creation of flavor is the sole aim of art? Um, some Rasa theorists see the pleasure of solving Rasas, right, again, so, well, the first one is that it's a mo the emotive theory is too narrow. Again, why? And it, it says this is the sole ple pleasure. Again, that seems too narrow, right? That we say it's the sole pleasure. Um, and then if you read the treatise on drama, it's very specific about how you should stage your play. Like characters should go out one door and come in the same door and things like this. Um, and you might think that it's very much tied to a very particular, very well-defined artistic tradition. So, you know, these rules might seem too rigid when we consider the art worlds that we live in, which has, you know, traditions from all over the world and so many different kinds of artworks available to us. For, um, there is a lot of gender and caste-based uh, oppression built into the theory, right? So the emotional taxonomy that we're given talks a lot about the kind of emotions that superior types would have versus middling types versus inferior types and versus God forbid women, right? Who tend to be lumped in with the inferior types. And so there's an interesting question of how much those kind of biases will, um, you know, make it difficult to, to, to use the theory. Uh, and then there are some like, oh, there's some quirks. There's some odd things they insist upon like the color coding of the various emotions or their connections to notes on the musical scale. Uh, that he says, you know, some people might, you know, find that a little bit off-putting. I'm not sure that's too much of a barrier. Okay, so finally, the really good stuff, what we can learn from this, and I think, again, there's five things. One, the importance of performance, right? So, uh, you know, a lot of people might think that once the artist has finished writing the play, it's done, you know, it's, it's, it's created as an artwork, and it has its properties, right? Um, how important is it that that artwork be performed? How important is it that that painting be seen, that that music work be listened to? And the author says, Rasa theory might kind of help us get back to that, that importance of performance or the engagement, as I put it, with the artwork, right? Um, you know, that we are meant to have artistic, aesthetic experiences with art. And Rasa can help us really think carefully about those experiences and what we value in them. And I think that's a, that's a fair point. The second one is, um, you know, it, like I said, Rasa theory tells us to think carefully about our experiences of art. What about the, um, 
the role of the emotions or the psych or psychology in that. And the author of this article thinks we can gain a lot from sort of insisting that the emotions play a really important role, that, that the aesthetic experience is not a cold cognitive act. And this is correcting against some theories that have tried to limit the uh, role of the emotions or saying that, you know, artistic works that appeal to the emotions are kind of cheap and easy, right? And that it, it's better to sort of appeal, you know, conceptually to something more highly cognitive. Um, right, so how much is this? And also he brings in the, the idea of the imagination and how important that is to art experience, right? That you kind of empathetically imagine yourself in the situation in some way. Uh, the third thing he thinks is the value of aesthetic experiences as a mean to transcend, transcend boundaries. And it's, that's kind of an interesting question, how much of our art experiences are sort of universal in nature and rather than particular? Because you sometimes, you know, you talk to little kids about watching movies and they have very specific concerns about Harry Potter and what his friends are up to. But how much is it about learning, you know, general truths about our lives and uh, what loyalty is, what friendship is, for example? Um, and how much of it is, you know, really concerned for the specific goings on. Um, again, another lesson is the importance of aesthetic immersion. Um, you know, getting, because of this transcendence, he says, not only can we lose concern of the individual or focus on the individual characters in the play, but we can lose a focus on the, ourselves as individuals. Um, and this points to some of the more religious developments of Rasa theory. There's a notion of transcendence to be sure, he says in the Rasa theory, but this need not be understood in traditional Hindu terms as spiritually transcending the mundane to realize unity with Brahman. Instead, the relevant notion of transcendence could just be understood as discussed above as transcending the particularities, characters, situation, place, time of the emotion theatrically presented as the cultured person savors a contemplative feeling consisting of general, generalized aesthetic emotions. And our final lesson is the compatibility of cognition and emotion in the aesthetic experience. Because even though the author describes Rasa theory as a motive theory, when you look at the details, um, there's a lot of thinking uh, and uh, reflecting that goes into the creation of the savoring moment of the savoring experience, right? So you might think of someone who's like savoring wine bringing to the table a lot, literally to the table, a lot of their knowledge about wine and different terroirs and different, you know, different seasons and whether it was a, you know, a dry year or a wet year and how that might contribute actually to the tasting experience. And so if you think about Rasa in that way, you might think maybe, you know, again, and this is something I think modern philosophy is, is very much open to that we don't want to dismiss the uh, cognitive importance of the emotions. Um, uh, and the uh, the importance of cognition to the emotions, either, either way, that goes both ways. Um, okay, so those, like I said, I hope that, ooh, five people entered the reading room. Let's let them all in. Okay, I'm sorry, folks. I just got that pop-up about you being in the waiting room. So hopefully... Um, yeah, it's, a great, just, it's great, great people. Yeah, so just... Uh -huh. Okay, uh -huh. excellent. So I just got that in, okay. and so I've let Wonderful. people in. Yes. So it's, I, I love coming to Annapolis. It's a great city and beautiful. Oop. Let's mute. Uh, okay. All right. So, sorry, I've just let some people in. I'm going to just end my presentation with some lessons, some possible discussion topics. And then, of course, we can take questions. Let me see if I can get back into this. The conclusion, remember there was this overarching project, which was to give a counterexample to the claim we have nothing to learn from classical philosophies um, and aesthetic, artistic and aesthetic traditions. And so he says, I hope I have shown the case through the case of Indian aesthetics that is not completely insane, as some readers might think, to engage with non-Western art and aesthetics, while they're both similarities and dissimilarities between Western and non-Western aesthetics, aesthetics, a careful look should reveal the non-Western aesthetics evaluated on its own merits has its own insights. Okay, so that's not too... Um... Okay, I've got another person in the waiting room. Okay, so some questions for, for discussion. Um, the, first of all, tied to this general claim 
about whether or not we can learn from the past. Um, and considering his criticisms about how, you know, some of it's tainted with biases that we now find very problematic and also with sort of eccentricities like, you know, tying the emotions to particular colors and things like that. And also, you know, um, in the literature I've read, it said Rasa theory sort of petered out after a while. Um, it sort of naturally because of changing artistic practices, but also because they feel like, you know, maybe everything had been said. So if that, if that sort of had naturally happened, you know, how much do we think we can get from diving back into a, you know, a tradition that sort of came to a natural end? So there's that general framing argument going on that we could talk about. And then also this, these, these various questions that seem to be coming out in Rasa theory about the role of emotions or psychological uh, states in our artistic experiences. How much is our engagement of art a matter of experiencing emotions, right? Having certain emotional responses to what you're seeing. What is the connection, if any, between the emotions we experience in response to art and our normal, ordinary emotions? You know, how do you think we should solve the paradox of horror, for example? Um, and that's the fourth one, right? Why should what? Why do we like to experience emotions in situations and artworks that we would avoid in real life? And then this all, and then finally, this idea of the cultured person, right? Do we, you know, are we do we think that makes sense, or is it is it really odd to say, you know, that some are some aesthetic experiences are better than others? Uh, you know, some some audience members are better better able to experience art than others, or is it really just beauties in the eye of the beholder and all eyes are equal?